Electricast. Hold on to your butts. We are changing the course of history as we see it. That is what Western demands. Now this affects Iris. Um, Iris, where are you? What you feel only matters to you. I do not entertain hypotheticals. The world as it is is vexing enough. Iris, I have a tip for you. Don't take drugs! Or whatever movies with Wesley and Iris. What up and welcome to Or Whatever Movies. I'm your co-host, Iris, and I'm here with my older brother, Wesley, who's a ghost because today we're talking a movie from 2021, Ghostbusters Afterlife. The band Nerf Herder recorded a song called Ghostbusters 3 about how it was never going to happen and no one thought they would ever see a Ghostbusters 3. Hey, that rhymes. Especially after Ghostbusters 2, which was kind of bud. And then uh, Ghostbusters 2017 happened, and this movie glosses over that completely. It just doesn't exist, in you know, canonically. And now we have Ghostbusters Afterlife. In all regards, an official sequel to the original Ghostbusters directed by Jason Reitman, son of the fabled Ivan Reitman. He still, like, oversaw the production of this movie and, and was proud of his son and got to see it before he sadly passed away. Mm. And you're all like, I'm not going to watch it. I'm going to watch Watch it on a plane. I was wondering where that was all going because that was quite the setup. I wanted to see it. It's hard for me to get out to the theaters. Thank you very much. And for some reason, Ghostbusters is not available. It was released over a year ago. Why is it not available on a streaming service? It was ready to go in June of 2020 and everyone was excited. But also it's on the Stars channel. So it wasn't so much that... The, that you felt that this movie itself needed to be seen on the big screen, but that there was so much history behind it that that's what it actually deserved. I mean, this is a good movie to talk about because I'm of the age where Ghostbusters was, you know, pretty big deal in my childhood. I was all of eight years old when that movie came out, but I certainly grew up with it. It's been in my consciousness forever. And it seems to tick all the boxes for a legacy kind of movie that has as much going on behind the scenes as it does on screen. The father-son dynamic of the Reitmans and all ready to go and I was all jazzed for it and the producers were like well we got to make sure that it sells and we're kind of trading on this nostalgia aspect so we got to get that Finn Wolfhard kid in here (laughs) he's the kid of the 80s and he looks a little bit like Egon I can see that the sci-fi horror kid coming off of it and Stranger Things Yep, and this one was set in rural or small town Oklahoma, which might as well be the 80s. Like, it's just forever set and stuck in the 80s? Yeah, and they're like riding in the back of El Caminos and stuff to the old abandoned mine. Yeah, but this wasn't set in the 80s. This is set in modern day. It could have been set in the 80s is what I'm saying. And, but you know how it's how we know it's in modern day? Because of the inclusion of the character of podcast. Oh, because of the... I thought that was a racial thing, but you're talking about the advent of podcasts. Podcasts in general. We saw this theatrically in uh, November of 2021, and then I had needed a refresher, so we watched it. And I got Kelly to sit down to watch it with me again. But then as soon as that kid showed up, she turned to me and she's like, you hate that kid. Podcast? And I'm like, yeah, I do. They went on an extensive search to find this kid, Logan Kim. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with this young man. But that podcast character, sorry, Jason Reitman, that is a terrible character. Oh. And every part of that movie in with that that kid was in, that that character was in, would have been better without him. And I had my doubts about young McKenna Grace. And I was like, oh, man, we're doing it with kids. Because they had long talked about another Ghostbusters movie and the idea of passing it off to another generation. But these kids were awfully young. And I was like, how is this going to work? Maybe it's because we're podcasters and we know that we don't need all the gear and the like that weird long boom, like the, like shotgun mic or whatever that was. Like, who wears cans when they're, I mean, does it look, is it just a podcasting kind of look? Yes, it's way more visual and cinematic, but also serious audio people wear cans. Cans, by the way, referring to the -the over-the-ear headphones. Serious people wear bedazzled in-ear monitors. I'm not talking about the Beyonce's of the world. I'm talking about the podcasts of the world. Okay, so you hated podcast, and you didn't totally hate McKenna Grace, but you kind of hated her. 
She's the hero of the film. No, 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 no. She was fine. She was serious and not like a dumb kid character. She never broke down and cried once. I appreciated the fact that she didn't process and demonstrate emotions the way other people did. Got no problem with that kid. So did you rewatch this movie for this review? I did. And before you did, what had what stuck with you? Um, the practical stuff, the car chases and, and so, I mean, this, obviously this movie trades hugely on the Ghostbusters nostalgia from the eighties and the Ecto one is one of the best fantasy movie cars of all time. It ranks up there with the DeLorean and to see it, that was like the promotional image that Jason Reitman first put out into the world. And he's like, Hey guys, I found the Ecto one. And it was like languishing in a barn somewhere. Right. Not really, but for the purposes of the movie and you're like, <gasps> and you like get a glimpse of the, the low logo and stuff and the um, and pull underneath the sheet but everything in this movie was shot practically as much as they could and the stuff that wasn't was actually kind of bad but when they bust that car out and he's driving through the wheat and stuff it was all real all the chasing and the, the driving was real it was great they had practical uh hell dogs or, or super hounds or whatever so you loved the practical effects you loved the car chases of which there were at least two yeah, and look, there was a lot of Ghostbusters. There are videos on YouTube of side-by-side -side comparisons of all the same dialogue, all the same gimmicks and shtick, and that was hugely heavy-handed and profoundly just, it was just overused. Like, they played this movie, they debuted it at Comic-Con for people who thought they were coming to a panel of Ghostbusters Afterlife, and they're like, how would you guys like to watch the movie? And they're like screaming their heads off every time there's a va even the vaguest Ghostbusters reference. Because I know all the Ghostbusters references. References. I got all of them. Yeah. And even so, I was like, man, seriously, that didn't need to be included. This movie can stand on its own, or at least it should. I agree. And I thought that was most played out with Gozer. Yeah, I don't know why we needed... This was like The Force Awakens or the Jurassic Park Dominion of the Ghostbusters franchise, because it was... Did it have to be Gozer again? What about Vigo? Vigo? Who's that? Oh, man. You don't even remember. You have to rewatch Ghostbusters 2, dude. Vigo the Carpathian. Oh, is v is Ghostbusters 2, I thought that was like Back to the Future 2, where you're like, mm, I'll just skip straight to whatever's next. Well, if you're going with the original Ghostbusters cast, Ghostbusters 2 can't be ignored. But even that retreads a little bit. But yes, I disagreed with Gozer coming back in far less spectacular fashion than, than in Ghostbusters. But not only was it Gozer, but did Gozer have to repeat all of her previous lines? Right. He's like, I think she remembers us. And she's like, are you a god? And then before that, she's like, are you prepared to die? And she's like, no, I'm 12. And it's like kind of cute or whatever. But does Gozer only know like three human questions? And, and like only one outfit, apparently. Okay, there was the Gozer retread, and then Callie has to be dressed like Sigourney Weaver in like a flowy on the red spectrum dress. And she has to say, what line did she say that was the same as Like, are you Zool's? the key master? Oh, she says, I, there is no mom. There yes. is only Zool. Yes. So you're so well versed in Ghostbusters, you didn't even need to revisit it for the purposes of this movie. I'm pretty well versed in Ghostbusters. I mean, we probably saw it hundreds of times when we were kids. And yeah. I revisited it recently just for the sheer love of it. So you ready for your Ghostbusters Afterlife quiz? Oh, man. No, but go ahead. Why did Egon die? Uh, that's a great question. So I and I can't say that I totally followed the cold open. He's like obviously prepared with his dirt trap. And he's baiting whatever spirit he was baiting. And then the power grid fails. And then he's sitting in a chair. And then he gets chair raped, like ghost original Ghostbusters style. <laughs> and then he's like gone. That's how he died. And so he died. And then the spectrometer thing or whatever lights up because he's now a ghost. Okay. But one of the ghosts got him. Was it Zool? It was a big baddie. It wasn't like just a ghost because he was doing his the whole thing that he had been building toward. And the spirit was like, pew, and it shot back to the Shandor mine. But the ghost of Egon stayed in the house. I guess so. He's like the happy ghost who like you can turn to to play chess or like we'll find the light switch for you. Right. So second question, why didn't Egon get sucked into the plethora of traps? Hmm. Well, don't you have to be like proton blasted, like controlled enough to be aimed into a trap like traps and they're not like all purpose like omnidirectional you have to like guide them into the trap 
and get that into like the trap field or whatever. Yeah, you do. See how long it took him to guide the thing under the muncher to trap that damn ghost? That was like a 20 minute ghost busting sequence. Oh, the Slimer like ghost that ate metal? No, no, it's very different. It's not Slimer at all. It's Muncher. Okay, but why doesn't it just like seep through and go through the bars? Like, why does it have to munch through them? Why does it get caught in the bars? Does it have a material, physical form? Because, yeah, Muncher is a very practical, real ghost. It can't just float through bars. And when it travels, it has to travel along the roads in the town, like at (laughs) at Buston Height. Like, they have to be... so they need to follow it all the way out to the Shandor mine so they can catch it. Just at busting height above the Cadillac. Exactly. That is a good ass point, Wes. Um, Muncher was not as charming as Slimer. And I don't think there was any ectoplasmic residue in this movie. No, there was, because when they first discovered Muncher, which, as Kelly Ray noted, uh, a, a ghost was conveniently made available the second she switched on the proton pack. And there was a ghost to bust. <laughs> but there was residue on the metal that it was munching. Oh, And they were tracking right. it. So we got Gary Gruberman. Is that how, what it was? Gruberson. He knows about traps. Whoa, cool replica. What, you don't know about what happened 20 years before you were born? How dare you? Yeah. He knows about ghost traps. I've wanted to do this all my life. Why would he open a 30-year-old closed ghost trap? Especially when he realizes it's like active, when a little wisp of smoke yeah. comes floating out. Yeah, they they hook it up to the to the school bus battery. It does a little sizzle thing. Why would you hit that thing, especially in front of kids? You thought he was irresponsible putting Cujo on for those kids. <laughs> man, he almost got them Cujoed. Oh man, it's pretty thin. But I think they thought they were just doing like a scientific experiment. But they obviously didn't think through to the possibility that there might be a live specter inside of the trap. That's their responsibility as scientists. To think through the possibilities? They're irrespo- They're one of many irresponsible small towners in this movie. They didn't have, they, they weren't like poised and ready to like proton pack the ghost back in it or anything like that. No, and after the ghost blasted out the windows of the school bus and the kids could have gotten hurt, they were like, whoa, and the kids are dicking around at the mine and they hop onto the little mine swing above the endless, the bottomless mine shaft, <laughs> and a freaking demon comes rocketing out of the mine shaft, and they're like, ha, ah. <laughs> Okay, so, wait, how are they? <laughs> they were like, ha, 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 dude, irresponsible small towners. Uh, and kids in general. Life is hard, but finding a really great podcast makes the days go by so much easier. Hi, my name is Blue Toulousma. I'm a writer, an emotional intelligence coach, and the host of Humanize with Blue Toulousma, a podcast where we believe that when you humanize everyone in the room, a great conversation is almost guaranteed. Join us every week here on ElectroCast as me and my guest co-hosts unpack big topics and interview even bigger personalities with a sense of humor and a dash of mischief. If you're looking for a new best friend in your head, we've got you covered. ElectroCast. These are all good points. The muncher, and I'm sure there's all kinds of excuses that you can come up with why he follows the path of roads, you know, like airflow and feng shui and who knows why (laughs) and then the irresponsibility of the summer school teacher and blah blah blah. like all of this makes perfect sense that it doesn't make sense but i want to know did you think about this the first time you saw this movie or did you think about it upon repeat viewing admittedly i thought about it for repeat viewing because i came out of ghostbusters afterlife being pretty happy with it Mm. you were like should you should i see it and i was like you should probably see that and then afterwards months and months afterward it's probably six months at this point since i saw it originally in the theater i started to wonder why did i hold it in in high enough regard Mm. after all this time and i thought about the stuff that was cool and i greatly admired the fact that jason reitman had a physical car and that they they had the foresight to plant that wheat uh, in the field for him to go driving around, even though Dirt Farmer never grew anything. There was a, like a whole field of wheat that they planted a year ahead of time so they could drive through it. And really only one take for that part of the wheat. Wow. And they did it for like 20 minutes and, and 
Finn Wolfhard is really in the car and there's like a dude on top and, and it's great. And it looks so good. It looks really, really cool, but in a controlled, weirdly fake fashion to me, like they tore apart the town, blew it to pieces and there were no screaming crowds. There was no one scrambling for cover. There were a few townspeople. There was another car, which I noted. I remembered it being completely empty. Hmm. And uh, I was like, why does this movie feel so, it kind of kind of feels hollow. Hmm. It seems like everything is in place, but it just felt like convenience hmm. to me. Mm-hmm. Especially the second time around. The second time around when I, I was, uh, I, I wanted to revisit it for the cool parts. And I was like, so some of this doesn't make sense. Yeah. Any other small towny weird inconsistencies? Like why, if you had the Shandor mine, and everybody knew how to get there, including the 12 year old podcast kid. Why wasn't that the local hangout, like the bum refuge, like the spray painted Lost Boys kind of cave? It's very weird. Yeah. And like, had they abandoned any archaeological studies or whatever on it? Like, why was it all yeah. curtained off? Why was it a secret? Why forgotten. did Egon keep it a secret? Everyone didn't know what was happening, but he was like responsible for keeping Gozer at bay with the automated proton pack set up right to keep the demons from bubbling out of that well but e egon tried he tried to talk to dan Aykroyd, but ray wasn't hearing it i guess i'm just saying he could have kept the townspeople safe instead of being all recluse or whatever because he saved new york but he couldn't save a small arizona uh, arizona oklahoma town from from itself well, I guess he did. I think to the best of his ability, he was warding off basically the apocalypse. Now, this, is, this isn't really a quiz. This is more like, what do you think about this weird inconsistency? Okay. Like, Egon can control things. It's like Patrick Swayze again ghost. With enough practice, he can manipulate practical things like the lamp or the, the chess pieces. Or he can, ha he can have a physical manifestation for a limited amount of time. But he can't or won't stop the, the danger dog from taking mom. Oh, in the house when she's like poking around inside of his uh, lab. That's his domain. Hmm. Yeah, 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 I guess they have to <laughs> pick and choose. <laughs> well, at that point, we don't know that he can take on physical form. So we have to save that for the end, for the hug, for the emotional moment. He can manifest for emotional moments. Yeah, but he chose carefully. He selected his outfit for the manifestation because we all know that Egon didn't die in a Ghostbusters uniform. But when he reappears, he's in he's in full Ghostbusters regalia, complete with proton pack, so he can match the other dudes. That's careful afterlife wardrobe planning there. Harold Ramis directed Groundhog Day, and he also co-wrote Ghostbusters. Is that right? Uh, I think so. That was Dan Aykroyd, I think, that wrote it, mostly. He's got a written by credit. Cool. So there's and there's a third uncredited writer. Can you guess? Uh, no. Rick Moranis, who was conspicuously missing from Ghostbusters Afterlife. Yeah, Rick Moranis had a thing. His wife got sick and passed away like in the 90s. After all, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. So he like walked away and raised his kids. And he was deciding to come back. I think he's got another Honey, I Shrunk the Kids in the pipe. But uh, he was like walking down the street and some like dude knocked him out. It was one of those like random where people decide to punch people on the street. But I don't know. You have Rick Moranis, who's like 70. Or you have Paul Rudd, who's Paul Rudding around Hollywood doing whatever. He's called, he, he's kind of Rick Moranising around, if you ask me. He's right. awfully, <laughs> he's awfully key mastery. Yes, he is. But, you know, you can have Janine and I can see that how she's like, she was always fawning over Egon and she doesn't have a huge role. It doesn't, you know, it would have been nice if they had been like husband and wife or something. Yeah. And she just like l left town after he died because she couldn't take it anymore. Sure. And handed off the keys to mom as like the last act before she took off. Because it would have been kind of nice to see Janine, her eyes filled with emotion, Demi Moore style when Egon reappears at the end, right? Oh, but I guess she couldn't be Callie's mom, though that was the problem, right? Who was Callie's mom? Don't know. Like, who did Egon shack up with? And was it a temporary thing? Do we know anything about this? No, it would be I would be curious to read the Ghostbusters Afterlife novelization because it <laughs> seems like there were a lot of instances of convenience where it didn't really explain what was happening or why, and we just kind of got there. 
I, I feel like this movie was kind of made to be pulled apart uh, because it holds true to the limitations of being a Ghostbuster sequel and fans expecting uh, some similarities and some callbacks. Then it has to adhere to some of those rules like Gozer, the Gozerian, I might add, was the ambassador of the Destructor that was the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man. And here, Gozer was kind of its own thing and wasn't ushering in the form of the Destructor who was going to take over, like, destroy New York City. Oh, that's right. Stay Puft, the Destructor, was is the arch baddie? Yeah. And, but we did get the form of the Destructor in the Stay Puft little marshmallow merchandise guys in mm-hmm. Walmart. Right. Whew, that's where those little ghosts belong is in Walmart. Because the only thing I hated more than podcast was those stupid Stay Puft Marshmallow Men and their little dumb roasting each other thing and the little umbrella with the... <laughs> oh, man. That was horrible and it was all over the trailers and I was so afraid. I was like, that is going to suck. Speaking of ghost town, pun intended. Who, yeah. Why were there... Hey, n- that's what it should have been called. <laughs> why was there nobody in the Walmart? Yeah, there was no one in the Walmart. There was no one at the checkout or whatever. Right. If people could see the the danger dog, they were that thing was doing crazy damage. Crazy damage, and, and then and when he's running out of the Walmart, there's like nobody running out. Don't know, because this movie had there were they they didn't have extras for that day. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, there's a lot that was just convenient. Yeah, working with extras is kind of an art form, and it can be kind of an afterthought, but really, when used well, it adds so so much. I mean. Think about the iconic moment when Rick Moranis is looking for help. (laughs) And he runs up to that fancy restaurant and it's beating on the window. (laughs) And then he like squeaks down it. Yes. And then he gets attacked and they all just go back to eating. Like brilliant use of extras. And and what I mean, and by extras, I mean background actors, background talent. Yeah. But, but it, so you remember he threw the thing into the he threw the coats into the coat room and they landed on the danger dog's horn. And then the danger dog came bursting through the door after him. But when he got taken out at the window to become the key master, the dog was invisible. It was. Yeah. He like squeaked down the window and people went on eating. Well, I think he was just out. He was out falling off in the dark. I don't think they so, ever went okay. invisible, although they kind of go invisible here. That's what I'm saying. I don't know if that dog was visible in the Walmart, which just means that for the Walmart employees, some dude is shopping in Walmart and all of a sudden there's carnage and stuff being thrown all over the place and he goes running out the front door. So it's just he's just the crazy like STEM (laughs) summer school teacher guy, which I think is par for the course in an Oklahoma Walmart in the middle of the night. (sighs) But he's a he's a scientist, dude. He's a si- seismologist. Seismo an amateur seismologist. All right, what else you got? J.K. Simmons, man. Yeah, what was that all about? Who was his character? He would, dude. Are you kidding me? He was the Evo Shandor, the madman from Tobin's Spirit Guide, who oversaw the construction, who designed the architect, who designed Dana Barrett's building in New York City with with girders of purest selenium. It was a conduit for the Destructor and for Gozer. And he got all that selenium from a little mine in Oklahoma, the Shandor Mine. Are you joking? No, he created the building from that mine to bring about the end of the world. So his purpose was to bring about destruction. And then why does yeah. Gozer rip him in half? You never studied. You never read Tobin's Spirit Guide. Would it trouble you to just tell me? Well, that was a quote from Ghostbusters. You never studied. Oh, to really? Venkman. Oh, yeah. <laughs> who says it to Venkman? Ray, for once, forget all the metallurgy and science. Like, can you just tell me what the hell is going on? And he's like, you never studied. All sad and forlorn. And Dan Aykroyd? That is who Evo Shandor is. And this is for the Ghostbusters nerds. In, in a way, it was an admirable throwback to Ghostbusters that furthered the story, where as much as we saw same, some of the same ghosts, some of the same tropes, a lot of the same musical cues. Oh, all uh, over the, the place. Uh, yeah, the dialogue, it was pretty heavy-handed, but the Evo Shandor stuff was pretty cool. At least we hearing about Ghostbusters Afterlife and they drop a teaser and you get brief glimpses of this town and you're like, what's this story going to be? And you see the glimpse of the Shandor mine and you're like, whoa. I was pretty happy and I was pretty excited about this movie coming out. And uh, and, and I liked it the first time I saw it. I did, not to say I didn't like it the second time around. It just doesn't bear up to you know pretty intense scrutiny very well. 
Right. It's fun for the ride and it's fun for this visit back into this world that you know and love. But does it hold up to the scrutiny? Does it stand? Does it truly stand on its own? And this brings me to a question about sequels. So we've discussed at length the sequel that adds value. A truly successful sequel will build upon, expand upon, or add to successfully a certain foundational kind of mythos or ethos for a film. Then there's like the complete retreads, which was kind of the hangover's problem, right? It's the same problem, just manifest in a different form. And then there's the Top Gun Maverick phenomenon where it's kind of a retread, like there's a, it, it's a similar story structurally and there's enough callbacks without being too much, but there's enough of its own story. And the, you know, the end mission was quite different, I guess, than what was originally pre- or, you know, introduced in Top Gun. Where does Ghostbusters Afterlife fall? Ghostbusters took the step back because it was set in this empty Oklahoma town. It was like a little like a side plot. And I, the mythos is really the only thing that grew and expanded. And it traded on some of the same stuff. But I think it was a little bit too much. Top Gun traded on the progression of the technology. And there was no new tech in Ghostbusters. It That's was a good just point. more traps, more of the same traps. Right. It was all of the science. It was all the technology in the hands of people who didn't do anything to earn it. Right. But the Ecto-1 was cooler. But the Ecto-1 didn't really serve a purpose. It had the gunner seat. I don't think that added a tremendous amount. But there is something to be said for the nostalgia. They didn't like use the equipment in any new, new kind of innovative way. There was no like better ghost-busting equipment. It was the same stuff. I have to think that this movie would have been pretty weak if it didn't come with the built-in nostalgia for Ghostbusters. And I also think that if I had been 11 after having watched Ghostbusters and then saw this movie with kids my age being Ghostbusters, I would have been way more, way more taken in by it. You would have preferred Ghostbusters Afterlife? I I think I would have liked this movie more than I did, especially the second time around, because it did get me in the feels and it got me in the the nostalgia the first time I see it. It just doesn't bear up to repeat viewings the way that Ghostbusters always will, in my opinion, Mm. because it was funny and it was audacious and ridiculous and, and salacious. And there was like the crowds and and Dana Barrett the, what was all sexy like but for this one this was a more family friendly movie I guess but let me tell you when little McKenna Grace uh, puts on the proton pack and fires it up I got chills I was like oh man <laughs> she that does was this, sweet she does she's great too with the little like where you blow back and then you're kind of like shaking and trying to steady it so uh... good it was pretty cool. And he takes that Cadillac out into the wheat field and it's all roaring and stuff. And the, yeah, yeah, those weird sirens, non-American sirens. Right. It was awesome. And <laughs> all he does is take it for a joyride and jump across the road when he hits the jump. And that's it. And it was freaking sweet. You wanted to see that car in action and you wanted to see them fire up the proton packs. And now we have the gunner seat and the thing. And he's really driving that car around the town and skidding out and stuff. And it was sweet. And that's really kind of it. Well, so if there was no new tech in the uh, in the movie, then why did Gozer get an update? Uh, why? Like, what was her update? She got bigger sh- and like spikier shoulder pads. <laughs> she got spikier shoulders and then she got like electric Currents. I mean, she was kind of electric before. You know who played Gozer? Uh, no. Uncredited Olivia Wilde. No, really? And so therein you're like, okay, well, you got Olivia Wilde. That's a good thing. But it was uncredited and Gozer didn't look the same. She looked like a Comic-Con Gozer cosplay or something. That, that's, what, well, <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Gozer was a little bit more designer or something like that. Yeah, she got way Gozier. She... <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna step it up next time I I do I go as goes or the Gozerian. I still have the flesh colored unitard, but now I won't just do Saran wrap. I'll do like the electro the electric y thing. I want to do I want to be Muncher. I could do Muncher. I have the body type, and I could have like one of those inflatable <laughs> costumes. And people at Comic Con do Force Ghosts from Star Wars, and they just put like like a blue gauze like wrap blue gauze around themselves, and it looks like a ghostly aura. Wow! I could do that. I think what you're saying is that the backstory of Ghostbusters Afterlife is perhaps it's at least as interesting as the movie, if not maybe just a touch more. 
the fact that it's Jason Reitman, the fact that you have all of the Ghostbusters back again, and then the and the fact that you have this amazing and actually really quite touching tribute to Harold Ramis. Like it was quite emotional. I I felt when she when he's guiding her hand and he's like there steadying her. Like I get kind of choked up thinking about it. It was a loving tribute to Harold Ramis, which I thought was very touching and very appropriate. If you were going to do the movie, you can't just gloss over it. So he was an integral part of the plot. They put a lot of lot of effort. They duplicated uh, Harold Ramis in CG until you couldn't tell the difference between the original footage of him in Ghostbusters and not. And then they aged him up through the decades. So it was pretty perfect. And then with the advent within and adding the ghostly haze around him, it was pretty good. I mean, he did look like a digital character, but we saw it in the movie and, and in the theater where it was blown up huge in maximum definition. And I thought it was it was pretty nice. The fact that they didn't belabor the character by making him speak or to try to match the voice. It was on par with a, a, a tribute in the same way that Iceman was in Top Gun. Mm. It was tasteful and, and not overdone. And it made sense from a story perspective, like they needed all four streams and they needed Finn Wolfhard on the on the power grid and they needed mom on the thing. And it was about all of them working together. You get all four Ghostbusters back together again and it feels like all is right in the world. I'm going to give Ghostbusters Afterlife with real consideration. I didn't come out of it with this lovesick kind of nostalgia. It doesn't matter. It needs to hold up as a movie on its own. And in that way, it does. Ghostbusters After Afterlife isn't bad. Nothing can measure up to its predecessor, the original Ghostbusters. It's impossible. So but for good. what it was, it was a different story. And yet the same story, it's an official all right. And that's our discussion on Ghostbusters Afterlife. An all right from Wes and a good from Iris. Check out Ghostbusters Afterlife, streaming on Stars. Add on to Amazon Prime or Hulu. We hope you enjoyed this discussion on Ghostbusters Afterlife. If you did, please like and subscribe to our podcast. Check out our other episodes at orwhatevermovies.com or please get in contact with us. 818-835-0473 is our hotline or whatevermovies at gmail.com is our email address. Can you believe that? We're ready to believe you. <laughs> Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. Hey, what's happening out there, everybody? This is Lawrence Ross, and I'd like to tell you a little bit about my podcast, The Lawrence Ross Show. Egomaniac. It's a two-hour weekly exploration into my mind. I also do sketches, celebrity impersonations. You're out of order! And I also do song parodies. Not too shabby for a blind guy. Not only are you visually impaired, but you are geographically impaired. New episodes are released every Friday. Check it out on your favorite podcasting platform or listen to it here on Society 13 on Electrocast. Hi, I'm Lessa Cadet, host of her Extraordinary Life by Design podcast, where we celebrate women who are shaping their lives one extraordinary day at a time. I speak with women from all over the world about what they do and how they are passionately pursuing their dreams and creating meaningful impacts on their communities. So come join us and learn about all there is to learn about these extraordinary women. Electric acid.